Next on the Broadway show, Tony winner Ben Platt is on the show to talk about starring in the revival of Parade in his latest Tony nomination. Plus, we're about to go ham. We're taking a walk with one of the Tony nominated stars of Fat Ham, Nikki Crawford. And you'll hear more of the secrets of this year's Tony nominees. I'm Tamson Fidel, and this is the Broadway show. If you're looking for the inside scoop on Broadway's biggest shows, you've come to the right place. It's the Broadway show. I'm Tamson Fidel. Welcome. But suddenly loud as a mortar, there is hope. Is back on Broadway starring Tony Award winner Ben Platt and Michaela Diamond. In fact, they're both nominated for Tonys this year for their work in this stunning revival. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. Already a Tony winner for Dear Evan Hansen, Ben Platt is nominated once again for his moving performance as Leo Frank in Parade. We caught up at the Rosevale Kitchen at the Civilian. So you're on Broadway, you're back. I know it was really excited to come back to Broadway. What's life like when you're on Broadway in this run? I, mean, I remember when you were doing Evan Hansen, it was a pretty, you were pretty much in lockdown, which is not a term we actually like to ever think about now, sure. post pandemic. That's right, different, <laughs> whole different meaning. But what is life like now during the run of Parade? It's definitely different. I mean, I, I, because I do get to be with Noah, I, I have more of a home to go back to. It's not just me. and. Um, I get to sort of fill myself up in other ways. I think with Evan Hansen, like you were saying, it, it just physically was so demanding that there was just no room for anything else. And I think I found, obviously I still have to do all of the annoying like vocal health stuff and the supplements and the drinking and the sleeping and all that. But I think with this show, it's been more about countering the grayness and difficulty of the show with yeah. just trying to have some bright moments every day. And so being with Noah makes that very easy. So I've tried to fill any time that isn't filled with great chats like this, with like um, just being with him and the dog and being in New York. We've never gotten to just like firmly live in New York I love as that. a couple, so yeah. I think Michael Arden is a genius, yeah, I your director, and I think that what they beautifully do in this production is they kind of lead the audience a lot with the real photos, and you almost feel like you're like watching a true crime story unfold, and mm -hmm. you're learning about the real people, and really gives you a connection while you're watching it. And I think it's exciting that you're kind of a vessel now to introduce this story to so many younger people. Absolutely, yeah. I think that I certainly, for many reasons, felt a lot of nervousness and pressure in terms of like what would be the right reason and an opportunity with which to come back after doing Evan Hansen. And obviously all I wanted is to come back because I just love musical theater more than anything and it's like the community that I value the most. And so I think as soon as Michael told me his concept for it and approached me, the combination of Michael and the piece was like such a no-brainer. I just knew that there's no person who couldn't value from seeing this particular story. So no matter what walk of life the person is coming in with, or you know, if they like Pitch Perfect or Evan Hansen or whatever it might be, it's something worth seeing. So I, I, I just feel really lucky that that's the piece that ended up being the one. I never raised my hand. I stand before. So you're Tony nominated in a category with two guys you were nominated with last time. I know. Josh Groban. Yes, and Christian Borle. And Christian Borle. The sweetest man around. Yeah, look at this little pack. I love that you're now at the tender age of 29, a senior member of this experience. And you know, like Michaela Diamond, your fantastic leading lady, Oof. she was she was saying that she's so thrilled to be able to go through all this with you. And she's like, he's not nervous at all. Uh, <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Colton Ryan was actually a standby for the role of Evan Hansen when yes. you were performing it. Does that seem strange to you? It's so lucky. I feel I feel really privileged. I think the only thing I regret that I had the first time around in what was an incredible period was just that I was so young that I didn't know to focus on being present in it because it mm. happened so quickly and there were so many life moments happening in succession that I just kind of let them by. And obviously I hold on to the great things, but I there's so many moments I'd wish I'd been more in my body for. And so I have my age to help with that. I have my fiance to help with that. And also having Michaela, who was the age that I was, yeah. not only am I trying to help her stay present, but she really helps me too, because we are going through the whole thing together. So to get to like look at each other and take it in has really um, been helpful. And it's felt like it's been a bit slower this time. I also want to ask you about Theater Camp. You yes. Have a movie coming out, which I saw, which is fantastic. Thanks. Was it just like a pandemic? Was this like a... Well, we something? made a, sh a short film in 2017 uh -huh. uh, of this Theater Camp idea. Uh, right. At Ripley Greer, very 
popular mm -hmm. theater spot for zero dollars in like 24 hours. And we loved the experience and we thought it was really funny and we always hoped to develop it. And so we spent a few years trying to develop it into a feature. The pandemic happened, it went away. And then as the pandemic was starting to end, we were like, let's try to make this happen. And we found some really faithful producers and they made it and they let us do it for 19 days and here we have it. You must be excited to get it in front of theater fans. So, so excited. I mean, obviously I think there's things for other people to enjoy and I, I think it's a comedy for anybody, yeah. but the most important thing to me obviously is that the theater community feels like it's authentic and it makes them laugh. and. I think it sends them up and, and indicts theater people in a way that only people who are them and love them can do. Want to see more of Paul's interview? If you do, head over to Broadway.com for an extended version. That ham is cooking. The Pulitzer Prize winning play nominated for five Tonys on Broadway's biggest night, including Best Actress in a Featured Role for Nikki Crawford. Let's send it out to Charlie Cooper. I thoroughly enjoyed Fat Ham because it feels like a very black play. It is. It's so funny, your it feels. character. It is, <laughs> exactly. Exactly, but your character in particular, I was like, I have an auntie who's just like her. Oh, I know, everybody <laughs> says that. It's like, you know, when I read James's script, I was sold within the first two pages. Mm -hmm. um, just because I identified with all of those characters. I grew up with those people, and then when I read Tidra, oh, I said, oh, I know her. Yep. I, I grew up with that type of woman, and I wanted to tell that story authentically, joyfully, but also show how complicated she is as well. Obviously, we're, oh, so many of us are familiar with Hamlet, but this is like Hamlet with a twist. It is. With some spice. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's, it's a loose adaptation of Hamlet. I just think it's a great time to tell the queer story, but also the black story. And, and for people to understand um, that really, there are no, we're, no we're, we're, we're all the same. And you very much feel like you're a part of this show too, because you guys do a lot of breaking of the fourth wall. Especially Marcel and I, right, you know? exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Can you remember a time where like the response from the audience was just like, whoa? Yes. <laughs> There's been a couple of times um, where I come out and I said, would you tell them? And then I said, they, they think I'm trashy, don't they? Because I married my late husband's brother. And then somebody yelled out, yes, we do. <laughs> yep. And I said, I hear you. I you know? love that. So, but we had fun. And then the other night, there was a guy who was asleep on the front row. And this is when I'm directing everything to the audience. And I said, wake up. And he jumped up. <laughs> and like, I started laughing. And the whole audience started clapping. So we could have fun with them. And of course, it would be remiss of me to not congratulate you for this Tony nomination. Thank you. Huge. What have you done to celebrate? Please tell me you've done something to celebrate. You know, I've only, I haven't had much time. Um, I bet. To even like, this morning I woke up, I was like, you're a Tony nominee. Like, yeah. it, it's just, I feel like a winner already. You know, I mean, I truly do. I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's not. This is my Broadway debut, and to come here in this amazing play that was also nominated for a Tony with all of these wonderful actors, and then to get that, you know, you know, recognition is, a, it's a dream come true. I'm so grateful. And listen, we're already here. We're yes, at work. I'm at work. So I'll let you go, break a leg, and have so you. much fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me. Still plenty more to talk about on this edition of The Broadway Show. But first, the secrets of this year's Tony nominees. The non-award awards? Yeah, everybody wins. That's what it'll be called. Everybody wins. The stupendous, miraculous, Mr. Fantastic Award. <laughs> for excellence. I want to say like the Neuroses Award, but I think maybe just Neuroses. The Tinies. The Borley, which interestingly enough is what I get a lot at Starbucks. Borley, Borley. Welcome back to the Broadway show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. It's time to be a part of it, New York, New York. It's on Broadway and nominated for nine Tonys this year, including Best New Musical and Best Scenic Design. Here's Beth Stevens with another edition of Building Broadway. Tony winning set designer Beowulf Borat is back on Broadway with the splashy musical New York, New York. I headed to his workspace to talk to him about being a part of it. When you were first approached with this project, what was the vision 
that was put forth about doing New York, New York. We always knew it would be a love letter to the city, and we all read that E.B. White essay about New York, which I, I knew of, but I had never actually read it before, and it's brilliant. It was written in the 40s, and it sums up New York so perfectly in a way that is unchanging, I guess, because it, it talks a lot about how we're all living stacked on top of each other, and you're, you're in the midst of so many people, and yet it can be the loneliest place in the world. And so some of that was what we wanted to try to capture with, with, the, with the production and, and the set. The show takes place in 1946, so you got to do a little research. Tell me about the inspiration for the look of the show. You know, one of the things that was really interesting and fun to do is we, as we were trying to figure out what the show should be, we obviously wanted to showcase New York and showcase both the, the glamour of New York and the beauty of New York, but also kind of what's difficult and ugly about the city. And so it's, I'm trying to get that duality in the set, that you've got these fire escapes that are, you know, covered with rust and grit. But that is in conjunction with these vistas where suddenly you see the Empire State Building in the distance or the Chrysler Building, or you walk into Grand Central and see that ceiling or the old Penn Station over and over again, trying to, to go to those kind of cinematic, famous moments, these kind of movie moments of New York that, that we get to experience kind of every day as New Yorkers, where you walk into one of those places and suddenly get a moment of that. The very first image I brought to Susan Stroman uh, in our very first meeting about the show, I had an idea of, of a doorman with snow shovels in the snowstorm digging and then suddenly the snow shovels would go up in the air and it makes Bow Bridge and a little elevator would lift up uh, our, our leads and they would be standing on Bow Bridge in a way that kind of only choreography can create a moment because it appears and then it's gone again almost as quickly. Uh, and then a similar idea for the, the whispering arch in Grand Central that uh, briefcases or suitcases would suddenly get held up in the air and become the arch of the whispering arch. And there's similar moments. So there's, there's parts of the, the Jimmy Francine love story. There are these fleeting moments that come and go and it's kind of the beauty of New York and, and the sort of the ephemeralness of the beauty of New York. But it was the kind of idea that I knew I could only do with someone like Susan Stroman who could take that idea and make it dance across the stage beautifully. It's not ultimately about the architecture or any of the other stuff, it's about people and that's what the show is about, how all these different people come into this crazy place and we all live on top of each other and we mostly get along and we mostly don't kill each other, but that that kind of ferment creates kind of the, the genius and the, the, the amazingness that is New York City. You always put Easter eggs in your in your scenic design, so just give us a few more. This if you one don't mind. is chock full of them. Um, there's, I think you know, I put elephants in my sets, and I've lost count of how many there are in this one. There's probably like ten. Um, but, and why do you do that? Um, I liked elephants when I was a kid, and it's nothing more than that. And I started doing it, and it's gotten a little out of hand. And we also in Wine and Peaches, uh, if people look carefully on some of the I beams, there's like these weird number and letter codes written. Uh, that are based on a real thing. When you build a building, the I-beams are created on the ground and they're marked that this one goes here and this one goes here like a big set of Tinker Toys. And we did some research into what those codes mean, but ours look probably correct, but in fact, one of them says F-E and has a date underneath it, and the other says J-K and has a date under it, and it's Fred Ebb and John Kander's birthdays. Oh. And once we did that, I showed it to John Kander, and he cried for a moment, and then he said, but Fred would hate you for this because he didn't want anyone to know how old he was. <laughs> and so we went in and crossed out the date and changed it and made him 10 years younger. <laughs> for tickets and more info, head over to Broadway.com. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for staying with us for this latest edition of the Broadway show. So glad you're here. I like the way you see the world. I like your point of view. A little sly, a little strange, a little bit askew. It's one for the ages. Kimberly Akimbo nominated for eight Tony Awards, including Best Musical and Best Direction. Here's Beth Stevens with another edition of Building Broadway. Thanks, Hanson. Jessica Stone had a healthy career as a performer before transitioning to directing, helming several shows around the country. Now she's nominated for a Tony Award for directing Kimberly Akimbo here on Broadway. I chatted with her in front of the Booth Theater. So you were a performer on Broadway for a long time. Was directing always a dream for you? I think I probably was all along because I was so interested even as an actor in things that had nothing to do with me. I was really interested in the larger parts of storytelling, um, but I didn't really take the leap until about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. That's how it started. So what was the learning curve for directing? I mean, I know that as an actor, you get to see a lot of different styles of directing, but when, when were you like, oh, I can 
I can do that. I know how to do that. I had, in in years previous to that, whenever I had downtime, you know, and there's quite a bit of it, as an actor, I would ask friends who were directors if I could assist them. You know, when you're in front of the rehearsal table acting, it's actually that hard. And it's very hard to see the forest for the trees. And then you are three feet the other side of the table watching it and the clouds part and it be, seems so um, seems so easy the solution seems so easy and so it's an interesting thing to know to have been on both sides um, that it can be that easy and it is actually that hard so let's talk about Kimberly Akimbo this is your first directing credit on Broadway and congratulations on your Tony nomination Thank you. Thank you. what was your way into Kimberly Akimbo well with a new show, it has to be the writers, no matter what. And so the thing I cared most about was uh, that David and Janine felt that their baby was in good hands. So it was really important to me um, to be right next to David and Janine, to really hear uh, what their goals were and what, what was most important to them in any given moment. So I spoke with David, Lindsay Abair, and Janine Tesori. And this, of course, is based on David's play that was produced off-Broadway, and Janine thought it could sing. When you first saw the script, did you think, oh yeah, this is a perfect musical? Yes. Oh. I, I, well, I first spoke with David about it. Um, before I was on board, we were talking about, a, I was directing a play of his in Boston, and, um, and so we were discussing that, and he had mentioned that, um, that he was gonna be, he was working on act one of this musical adaptation of Kimberly Akimbo, and I gasped, and I thought, oh wow, that's an amazing idea, that play really sings. And so when it came around about a year later, I was really excited and then really delighted to hear the score, because in fact, and I think David has said this, um, it really has deepened the play because you have insight into the character's subtext that you don't have in the play. And so I think it's actually made the story deeper and richer and better. So for people who don't know, this musical is about a, a teenage girl who appears to be much, much older. But there's also this aspect of it where everyone is just a little quirky, a little off. So tell me about finding the sort of the humanity and the realness in those very quirky, very funny characters. Well, I think the challenge with this play is they're, they're very funny and, and they could be very broad. Um, and it was really important to us, particularly with the parents and with Aunt Deborah, that, um, that we're not just looking at villains because they actually, um, they love Kim deeply, but they're bad at it. <laughs> and I think we know a lot of people like that, who the, the intent is right, but um, the execution and the impact is all wrong. And so um, I think you can't, if you just have sort of arch villains or sort of broad characters that aren't based in truth or based in any of the details from our own lives, um, I think it's hard to connect. So it was really, really important to, um, to make sure that as absurd as the story can sometimes be and as absurd as the situation is and as um, the circumstances are, that there isn't a single moment that someone can't say, that actually reminds me of a, a slice of my own life. The Tony Awards are just a week away. Can you believe it? And for the first time ever, they'll be taking place right here at the United Palace. Let's head inside and talk to CEO Mike Fiddleson about hosting Broadway's biggest night. Wow, Mike, we are here on the stage. We're in just one week the Tonys are going to be. This, this is absolutely stunning. I had no idea this was in here. You're not the only New Yorker. It's been here for 97 years, and a lot of folks have walked by a thousand times in their lives and never thought to walk inside. As far as the Tonys go, you know, what kind of a difference is it in preparation, getting ready for something like that, as it is, you know, getting ready for one of your movie nights or That's your That's a concerts? great question. We've been talking to the Tonys for years, uh, mm -hmm. trying to make this happen, and, and this was the year um, that they really wanted to expand their audience, they wanted to expand their footprint to try something new, um, which we're, we're very honored to be having the Tonys here. It's gonna be an experience that none of us has ever had, that the, <laughs> the neighborhood has never had, which mm -hmm. we're very excited about. 
and I think for Tony goers, I mean, today was your first time here. Right. What do you think their experience is going to be when they walk in that door for the first time and say, holy crap, I didn't <laughs> know this existed. But I think for the, the die-hard 42nd Street crowd, yeah. um, making that trek up here, learning not only about the theater, but about Washington Heights right. and, and all of the, the beautiful other cultural institutions and the parks and the restaurants, um, I think it's going to be folks discovering a whole nother part of New York City right. that they didn't even know about. We can't wait to introduce those people not only to the theater, but the neighborhood and its parks and restaurants and cultural institutions. Right. That's all for now. I'll see you next time. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is a Broadway show.